government sees its primary role as maintaining an optimism uh, amongst the general public that it is in control of public policy on climate change. And for that reason, it can be seen to be pandering to public opinion, which does not want to make changes that it would prefer to avoid, such as limits on flying, if not total ban on flying, for all the good reasons that would justify it if one hadn't to take account of the extremely damaging effects of the release of greenhouse gases in the upper atmosphere uh, where planes are used. The justification for that air travel being that uh, it is needed for maintaining family connections where those require intercontinental travel or likewise for business purposes or for touristic purposes must not be seen as the justification for continuing to exacerbate the problem of getting down to zero emissions if we are rarely to take the necessary steps to prevent uh, disaster. At the heart of the process leading to what I see to be almost impending tragedy uh, lie a number of fallacious assumptions, almost tenets of faith and uh, dangerous assertions uh, which inform policy makers um, and their advisors in this area of public policy. They continue to stand in the way of making that transition towards uh, the uh, adoption, the wide adoption uh, of uh, policies and practices uh, which will lead to as close to zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, as is at all possible uh, and without which um, progress on limiting the inevitable damage from climate change can be achieved. These assumptions uh, cover critical aspects of the decision-making process. Let me cite a few examples. Firstly, there is this view that people have an inalienable right to do what they want uh, without regard to the wider social and environmental consequences. For instance, uh, very, very few people would consider the consequences in terms of con its contribution uh, to the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere to say I won't fly on holiday to uh, Australia or um, I won't take up a job which would entail car commuting over a long distance um, in view of the fact that I do care about the future and would not wish to make uh, this situation even more difficult than it is at present. There can be no justification too for not uh, raising the matter with those who are making decisions which facilitate um, this process um, and therefore make their own indirect contribution to it. And here I'm thinking of in the UK such instances as the uh, construction of new airport facilities to cater for the growing demand for air travel uh, when we know so conclusively how damaging it is. Not only does it bring advantages in terms of raising that quality of life, uh, but it also helps and is, that's used as a further justification for its promotion. It, it leads to more employment. But how can one continue to allow for uh, the pursuit of economic growth without differentiating between whether that growth is good for the planet or bad for the planet. In other words, whether it is aiding and abetting the absolutely essential requirement that we limit uh, the increase of concentration of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. 
It's assumed that one can reconcile uh, the fact that economic growth is too closely coupled uh, to the uh, use of fossil fuels uh, and that because it can be decoupled it's only a matter of time be before we can decouple it fully and of course that is absolutely ridiculous to think that that would be possible and it, when one sets that against the fact that um, every activity using fossil fuels even on a small scale is making the problem even greater than it is to meet the challenge of the rising concentration uh, of these emissions um, one realizes what uh, impossible position policymakers find themselves in insofar as they would wish to uh, meet what the public demands. Well, basically the public wants to have its cake and eat it. And here we are, the, the most extreme incident in, in which the public not only should not, but cannot carry on uh, ignoring the consequences of their action. And only government can intervene to prevent that occurring. A further assumption that uh, informs public policy is that we can attach a monetary value to every consequence of our actions and this can be seen in relation to the way in which, uh, uh, for instance, Lord Stern in 2006 uh, published, uh, well at least he didn't publish, wrote uh, the report called The Economics of Climate change. And the fact is that this is very unrealistic. How can one conceivably attach a monetary value uh, to the uh, enforced um, uh, migration and need for resettlement of millions of refugees who will, uh, in effect, for ecological reasons, will be forced out of the areas that they live in simply by virtue of the fact that the climate has changed, there's more likely to be drought or flooding or temperature rises which are so intolerable that the population cannot support it. It's claimed that the market cannot operate um, uh, without uh, uh, money values attached. Um, and that then enables pricing policy and taxation to be set by government and industry in collaboration. Uh, but that is unrealistic. It's unrealistic because some aspects of life do not lend themselves to evaluation in monetary terms, such as uh, happiness uh, or the fact that um, uh, in due course millions and millions of people are going to uh, have to become ecological refugees from the areas of, from the regions of the planet which have been rendered uninhabitable uh, by climate change. And yet it is argued that the market can't operate unless price, prices are added um, for that process to continue. I mean, a further example could be added to this, which is the proposition that uh, fossil fuels are replaced by biofuels. Um, but what that has led to and is going to lead to more and more if we go down that particular route is that uh, on this land rather than building, sorry, rather than planting crops which can then be used uh, for energy purposes as substitutes for fossil fuels, uh, that denies that land being used uh, for growing crops upon which the local population lives. And what evidence there is on this already shows that local populations are finding it more and more difficult because prices go up. Um, uh, in order to compensate for the fact that landowners by planting bio crops uh, derive uh, more substantial revenues than by growing crops for food. There is too a significant amount of wishful thinking uh, that uh, carries on insofar as it is implied then rarely stated uh, that the changes that are necessary or I would put it uh, essential uh, 
cannot be achieved on a voluntary basis. There is no prospect whatsoever of people being so well educated that they unilaterally, so to speak, say, uh, I'm going to forego flying, or I'm not going to take on a job which entails uh, heavy use of fossil fuels. Um, it's quite clear that what has got to happen in these circumstances is that it is made mandatory uh, that one uses a very low amount of fossil fuels uh, to uh, enable the preferred lifestyles to be uh, adopted and maintained. That is just not possible. Uh, once we're talking about mandation in order to achieve the desired objective of uh, getting us quickly as possible down to levels of zero uh, carbon emissions uh, brings into, a f into uh, relief uh, an even more significant and disturbing aspect of this uh, area of po policy, uh, namely the fact that in a democracy, and most of the countries which are most active in this area of climate change are democracies, in a democracy uh, change cannot be achieved unless it it uh, attracts the majority will. Well, I think it highly unlikely that however well educated the public is on the significance of this issue, that they are going to say, uh, I will vote for a government which will uh, not allow me to carry on with the damaging lifestyles such as including flying, uh, upon which, in which I've been engaged uh, for the last uh, 20 or 30 years. It just is not possible. So what do we do then in the face of the fact that it requires something that can be viewed as being undemocratic? In other words, decisions being made for very good reasons, for ecological reasons, which run counter to what the public is willing to support. Allied to this particular problem is the fact that whilst some individuals can be persuaded uh, to act in what I would call a, a, a uh, ecologically considerate way, um, uh, doesn't provide then uh, hope for that, um, um, that agreement, so to speak, on the grounds of evidence to spread so widely that everybody uh, will uh, 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 agree to such a process and yet the solution to this critical problem uh, of uh, climate change requires that everybody uh, plays their fair share in the process. That's everybody. One can't have one country or some um, parts of its population ignoring this requirement. It therefore, in my view, reinforces the case for making it mandatory and the process of making it mandatory is not so politically unrealistic when one uh, can refer back to the situation in Britain in 1939 when the proposition that fossil, sorry, the proposition that food should be rationed was widely accepted because it was seen that we are dealing with a finite commodity and the only way of uh, treating it is in order is to uh, share it out equally across the population and not to rely on uh, the pricing mechanism or the market to determine how much food costs because of course course on equity grounds that would have uh, that would have uh, or inequity grounds that would have led uh, to uh, the growing incidence of death amongst poorer people. Many would argue that the solution of the, to this problem lies in uh, giving sufficient opportunities and investing as widely as possible in technology and science uh, so that we can find ways and means of delivering the lifestyles that are preferred and that the third world are understandably wishing to uh, adopt as well yeah, can be met but through invention, through in, in innovation, uh, through uh, better practice, through changes in behaviour that can be promoted uh, through but by various means. Uh, but technology has limits on it and I think in this instance 
it's as well to cite uh, the most uh, difficult of problems rather than the easiest of problems. Of course, uh, technology uh, has played and will continue to play an increasing role in this, for instance, in making uh, new housing zero carbon emissions uh, if through the sensible use of materials and other I innovations. Uh, but that cannot be done when one's talking in the areas of transport. Uh, very often, uh, recently, uh, it has been cited that uh, electric cars uh, are, are the way ahead, overlooking the fact that the electricity uh, required in order to charge the batteries on which these cars rely uh, is uh, uh, generated um, through burning fossil fuels in the main and it is just pie in the sky to think that we can achieve such uh, um, uh, amount of electricity through the medium of renewable sources of energy on the scale of demand uh, that is uh, required to meet current lifestyles. Allied to this is the problem with the fact that we have in effect negative time to achieve these changes and yet even if it were changed to electric cars um, that derive their uh, source of energy from renewable sources uh, would obviously take time, uh, years and years to bring about on a, on, on a total scale or near total scale. But we don't have that time because during the process of uh, uh, arriving that uh, uh, arriving at that desirable uh, goal, um, uh, we are still dependent upon fossil fuels which are adding to the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. I find myself having to repeat this theme because again it is overlooked uh, so often. Industry uh, and government talks about the fact that by uh, let's say 2030 we can look to a time when there will be charging points in cities to generate, to uh, in effect uh, uh, act as uh, the, the means of enabling electric cars to operate over, over um, wider, wider distances. Uh, but during that process uh, their most uh, cars will be still be using fossil fuels uh, adding to the concentration. So uh, let's not deceive ourselves by saying because it is possible therefore that's what we've got to do as if there aren't those time constraints. And then on top of it is the fact uh, that there are also of course financial constraints. Uh, those financial constraints uh, uh, relate to the revenue available to the government uh, in order to promote and enable and facilitate the uh, construction of uh, infrastructure uh, to provide these alternative uh, um, low carbon uh, uh, um, means of uh, meeting one's uh, wishes for what were previously energy saving um, uh, activities uh, that cannot uh, that cannot continue simply because uh, the source of revenue much of the source of the revenue of government is derived from taxing and economic growth as economic growth, as I said before, is so t closely tied into the burning of fossil fuels, we're in a really ridiculous dilemma because that is the source, as I say, of revenue enabling the major changes the government is going to have to make if we are to have any chance of seriously limiting the damaging effects of climate change. There continues to be much emphasis on the role of energy efficiency, uh, the fact that we can get through innovation and technology um, more miles, or I should say more kilometres, out of a litre of uh, petrol. Um, but this overlooks the fact that unless there is a cap, uh, the greater efficiency with which that is achieved uh, results in lowering the unit costs of, uh, of uh, car use and therefore promoting car use because it becomes cheaper. So this points in the direction of caps having to be set before the benefits of greater efficiency can be assured.
It is thought that the world's population is better off if more fossil fuels can be found and that explains why exploration for more reserves continues, for instance, now in the uh, Arctic regions uh, where there are distinct prospects of finding more uh, oil and gas. Uh, but evidence from other sources shows that we should not, if we are to protect the planet, we should not be burning even uh, two-thirds of the fossil fuel reserves that have already been found. This flies again in the face of uh, economic growth and allied to that, this whole proposition uh, that if we can find, that uh, each country can find more fossil fuels, it increases its security of supply because it is no longer dependent uh, upon uh, countries whose political system uh, is thought to be unreliable or who, or countries uh, which have the opportunity of holding countries, uh, holding to ransom countries which do not have their own reserves of fossil fuels. So all in all, uh, this poses uh, further problems because we continue uh, to seek out more sources of fossil fuels at a time when common sense dictates that we should not only stop um, looking for more because we mustn't burn even what we have already found. Allied to this is a, uh, a matter to which I've already referred to, uh, which is the way in which we treat these finite reserves. Again, though not stated, it is assumed uh, that because we have found it, this generation, the previous generation have found these reserves, we have got a right to use as much of them as we wish. But what that implies is that we ignore the claims of future generations. It implies that because we consider it acceptable to fly long distances, um, maybe for uh, having a stag party before marriage or for seeing some extraordinary uh, uh, event or, or uh, say see, to see the rainforests or something like that, 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 that is a, a more um, desirable way than of leaving um, as much as possible of these fossil fuels for more essential uses that may well come up uh, and be demanded by future generations. But we're not even thinking about those claims. It's extraordinary. So I would argue that it is time to end uh, this um, whole process of um, carrying on with policies based on these fallacious assumptions and lines of reasoning. We've got to do something very, very distinctly different.